Farah, thanks again so much for, for being here with us. Um, I guess, <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. Did, did you want to introduce uh, or say a little bit about the film before I ask any questions? Yeah, I mean, um, Sales of a Legal Education was created originally as um, a video dance installation. So it's been screened as a film as well, but um, yeah, when it was envisioned, it was more about the installation where there is the setting of the kitchen when people come in and then they are asked to um, to follow some uh, account, like three or four um, tasks, what I call more than orders, <laughs> um, and then uh, such as. Um, leaving 20 seconds between the first person and then the second person um, or between each person and then um, watching for obstacles uh, through the entry since I put some obstacles just before um, the kitchen table where people can sit and, and watch the video and then to have a fruit um, that would reflect the um, the familiar situation that students and teachers were creating um, in their encounters. And the final one is to leave from the back door, whatever it was possible, uh, to, to keep the secret, the organized um, operation, let's say, until the end. Um, so, yeah, I, I see it uh, still in, in my imagination as an installation. Um, but of course it gives another um, experience when you watch it as a video which is also um, okay <laughs> yeah it definitely feels uh, yeah I feel like experiencing the work kind of in person as a as a performance or something would make it yeah feel quite different um, well I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the first Infantata of Occupied Palestine, which the work, of course, references. It's a time when Palestinians were barred from gathering and learning from traditional pedagogical institutions, universities, schools, uh, whatnot. Um, but of course, the video kind of refers to when people would organize hidden or other kind of non-public ways of learning in the face of being caught. I wanted to know if you did any research on these, the consequences of, of carrying out, you know, um, an, an action like this. And I guess uh, because they're they're doing this in the face of these consequences, you know, how do Palestinians view that value of education as they were persisting in learning and teaching, in spite of these clear rules um, by the uh, um, uh, the Israelis, uh, or at least discouragement from doing so um, for these forced school shutdowns. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, during the. Um, First Intifada, as you were saying, um, schools and universities were closed for a um, long, long time, like 51 months was the longest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and people started organizing and um, or organizing education in schools and universities. And um, they were actually called cells of legal education because it's uh, illegal, therefore there are consequences, as you say, and it's mainly about um, imprisonment. So lots of people were put in prison because of this um, popular education. Uh, some, um, some settings were destroyed, uh, so like the dorm in Birzeit University, uh, parts of it were, were destroyed. Um, uh, sometimes it was in the ki like in the kitchen uh, of a, a teacher or something or so it, um, so yeah it, it was basically about being caught and imprisoned or uh, some places were actually destroyed or shot or yeah so mm. the, um, and you you were talking about the value yeah of um, I also tackle this. Um, in the video in the sense or in the work in the sense um, that I, I, I say that I don't work directly or only with reenactment but it's also about transformation and deformation of the gestures and the narrative in, in the sense that um, I don't want to deform the narrative I'm, I'm playing with it um, to 
um, tackle nostalgia and also tackle um, so for instance at the moment in Palestine everyone's talking about the first intifada because the second intifada so the first intifada happened um, uh, late 80s until the beginning of the 90s and then the second intifada was from 2000 to 2005 let's say and um, the first intifada was a lot about civil disobedience and popular uh, resistance and the second one was a lot about also um, um, uh, like armed resistance and 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 there's lots of a, a big debate around it and and what was useful for the Palestinian cause or not and and there's lots of nostalgia for the first one where it was really like popular organization um but then when you go and dig into what really happened uh, because i did lots of um, uh, interviews also so i worked with archive material but interviews also and lots of imagination and people were actually saying that um there was little education it was more about the acts and the gesture and that's why i say deformation of the narrative because if you go and read about it it's all about oh this uh, movement and popular education but then it's it's yeah it was more about about the gesture about mm. not wanting to abide and then another yeah just a, another note about this transformation or deformation and not pure reenactment is about women's role in the first intifada which was prominent but now when you go and read about it or you hear about it it's not very it's not there <laughs> somehow it disappeared it's latent um, so in the pictures as well, um, when I talk to people where I got these pictures, so it, it's all personal archives. Of course, we don't have a state archive because we don't have a state. Um, so when I, I took these um, pictures, for instance, from uh, people, students of, and activists from that period, um, I was wondering, like, where are the women in the pictures? And they were like, um, they were not in this picture or that night it was late, they didn't come, but usually they were there. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah. So while talking to people, uh, of course, the, the, um, the role, the w women's role is huge, but it's not documented or it's not there in official archives. So I was interested in working with three female um, figures and three male um, and deforming these pictures that we were working with uh, and playing with the before and after of each um, picture uh, based on imagination. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting talking about um, uh, that aspect because I think it kind of dovetails into the next question about talking about the importance of dance, but more specifically, at least uh, bodily autonomy that the film conveys through these seemingly kind of chaotic but choreographed movements um, of the work subject. So to you, what's the relationship between, you know, living under that oppressive rule and reclaiming some type of corporeal autonomy um, via dance or movement or, or performance? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, uh, I find I find it essential for my being <laughs> and I feel lots of people find it as an outlet but not only it's like a lot about um, expression but also documenting or um, yeah it's about presence that we are here um, yeah the Palestinian situation is a lot about um, controlling bodies controlling yeah. lands or controlling movements Mm -hmm. um, my parents, for instance, are are still in Ramallah, and um, now it's becoming a bit like Gaza, another big prison, the whole West Bank, because of, um, first of all, because of, I'm not sure if it's first of all, but it's, um, things intersect. So at the moment, there is COVID, of course, so um, the... Um, uh, the bridge, let's say, which connects Jordan to Palestine is completely, the crossing, land crossing uh, between Jordan and Palestine is completely closed. And then, of course, Palestinians are not allowed to travel through Tel Aviv. So there's no way out of the West mm -hmm. Bank at the moment. And uh, this might continue. So the, the Gaza scenario might go to West Bank as well. Um, 
also because of the political situation and the annexation and um, etc. So it is a lot about controlling bodies and movements. Um, and dance is a is an outlet and not only yeah it has different layers of why like i feel it has different layers why it's it's important on a personal level but also on a collective um level yeah i think um uh i know some other artists who produced work behind kind of different oppressive regimes um and just the you know kind of simple interventionist acts of being free with your body or being free with your movement were quite quite radical, quite rebellious um, mm -hmm. within that context. And I guess you, you kind of just spoke a little bit about this, but I wanted to talk um, a little bit about the idea of isolation and like historically, and then I guess within um, contemporary Palestine because of not only COVID, but of um, um, kind of the, the recent history of Palestine. I don't know if you've, if you thought that you've chatted about that already, but yeah, just kind of, you know, geographic, political um, isolation within within that region, and how that's shifted or changed or not. I mean, again, then it's very complex um, because, of course, now the West Bank, for instance, is is uh, little um, dots, <laughs> isolated dots, and then Gaza is completely isolated. But then, of course, there's the Palestinian diaspora. Uh, that's everywhere in the world um so it's shattered it's the complete opposite kind of <laughs> isolated yeah. so it's uh, yeah I, I can't say that yeah the Palestinian situation is a situation of isolation mm -hmm. I can be a, a situation of imprisonment um I was discussing this with a uh, with someone yesterday um, many people now are relating it because like a quarter of Palestinian adults uh, or the Palestinian males were imprisoned by the Israeli occupation by now. So it's huge. Like it's mm. a collective experience being in an Israeli prison. Um, so, and yeah, it's, um, I, yeah, it's, it's one of, the aspects of the mm -hmm, Palestinian mm -hmm. situation at the moment, for sure, isolation. And some people were even uh, laughing about how quick people uh, could uh, be put into a lockdown because they're oh. used to it. Uh, Israel in one day can uh, put a curfew and everyone will, is obliged to stay home. Of course, there is resistance and disobedience and everything, but it's embodied, like, you know how to do it, you know how, how to deal mm -hmm, with it. Mm -hmm, it's not um, it's not nice to do it, but yeah, it's just yeah, it was the same for me here because I was in, in Palestine during the two thousand two reinvasion of the West Bank. So when the lockdown happened here, where I am in Edinburgh, as if I I was I knew what was like. Of course, there are no bombings and um, yeah. electricity is there and water is there and the food supply. <laughs> It's not uh, an invasion by, <laughs> like by far, but um, yeah, you just uh, yeah, you you know a little bit what to do when you're isolated. Yeah, I um, you kind of touched on the next topic a little bit. We're, I'm talking about like kind of performance acts or uh, political acts of dissent, um, working within different countries and nation states. So I guess I kind of wanted to not not make a parallel, but ask you, um, you know, the current climate within uh, political protest, specifically in, in North America. Um, the, you know, I want your kind of idea on the role of protest or the types of protest that you might find um, are maybe not maybe not most effective, um, but you might find are the are more valuable. Um, because we see all these protests, you know, happening in North America, but also there's so many different forms and, you know, they take just with your work, you know, they take so many different, um, uh, yeah, f forms throughout the, throughout the world. So I kind of wanted to, yeah, chat a little bit about the idea of protest and forms of protest. Yeah, I mean, I've been following uh, what's going on and I um, completely relate to the struggle uh, and um, yeah and I see lots of parallels of course uh, yeah it's not the same situation but um, 
yeah and i don't really like at the moment the word solidarity because what does it mean mm. but yeah i can yeah i can relate um and there are already very interesting ways of protesting uh which started way before um with with the first uh, wave of um demonstrations with don't shoot Mm. then at the beginning and then th there was lots of um gestural work um mm -hmm. around it uh, already the the don't shoot yeah. or um some people took the standing man from turkey mm -hmm. to the us yeah. uh, and then there there was the dians so yeah. actually i'm very much in, in following also for my own work and my own research around the archive mm. gestures um, and, and I see it very effective because it's something that talks to everyone. They are gestures, not abstract movements. I don't have anything against abstract movements, but mm -hmm. gestures are something that everyone can recognize and connect to. So it's yeah. very effective to like to engage um, people mm -hmm. and yeah, just um, keep it going, keep the demonstrations going. Yeah. Um... Okay, let's uh, open it up if there's any questions from, um, you know, uh, typed in or I'm going to let people know uh, within the chat if you want to message me any questions, uh, feel free to. And I know that um, Nora and Claudia might have a couple. Oh, yeah, there we go. Ada, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, there's this really interesting thing that you brought up earlier, um, you know, in terms of um, gathering material from individual archives because, you know, there exists no state archives because there is no Palestinian state. And this was an interesting topic that also came up last week during the first part of this program with an artist, Jumana Mana. And I thought it was very interesting just the relationship that can be drawn between both of your works and kind of, I guess you could say, situating this kind of historical knowledge in the human body as a way to convey it by means that aren't quite so precarious as like a piece of paper, right, that you might not be able to trace back to something because it doesn't necessarily have a kind of, um, I guess you might say, um, a chain of command that can be easily traced because these materials are so uh, dispersed, right, and not centralized in any particular place. And so I wanted to perhaps hear your thoughts on this idea of embedding uh, the body uh, with this kind of knowledge through movement, through choreography, as, you know, using, I guess you could say, performance as this way of transferring knowledge through movement. And perhaps if you could also speak to what kind of information this might give you that you might not be able to get from just looking at a document or a photograph. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I've been researching um, since like 2014 the idea of the body as archive and more specifically working on a long-term project called the Archive of Gestures. Um, so Cells of Illegal and legal education was the second narrative that I, I worked with and tried to unearth through the, the body uh, and the bodies of um, my co collaborators. Um, so yeah, as you say, for me, the body is, um, carries uh, this knowledge um, that it, it lived, uh, but also accumulated from previous generations by, by hearing uh, oral uh, history and, and seeing images. So it's like, it's this accumulative um, um, process of archiving um, the personal and the collective. And then um, I feel that I um, prioritize the body uh, and, and working with the body as archive rather than just mere documents. It's a lot about uh, affect and, and so it's the knowledge and the, uh, the, the affect that it carries and can transmit, uh, which maybe documents or other physical archives don't. Um, and, um, and from the beginning, um, I started uh, to work with this transmission um, that now I call it less, less transmission, but it's more exchange 
um, uh, th through interactivity and participation in these um, installations, but also live performances. So how would this bodily archive um, disseminate? So it doesn't only, uh, I don't only carry it, but since we are all living archives, so how do I exchange uh, my knowledge with yours uh, without doing copy and paste? So uh, if I ask you to interact with me and um, Put you in the context of this um, narrative, this hidden narrative, uh, and then ask you to reenact in your own way these gestures uh, as a way of trying them and, and yeah, embodying them in a different way with your own, own interpretation. Um, so it would be for me a way to disseminate this knowledge and yeah, just make sure that it doesn't disappear that it transforms and even deforms, but it doesn't disappear because there's lots of discussion about the body and performance being transient. transient. So, so it dis disappears after the performance period, which I try to challenge. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, was there any other questions by the Axis Curatorial Collective? I think I have uh, one more question and it's something that, you know, in watching your video, Claudia and I were talking about it and it's um, the term they use uh, cells. We know that the, um, that the Israeli military sort of imposed that term cells of illegal um, education, but that term uh, cells offers like an entry point into discussions about both the body and the military. So there's the idea of the military definition of cells, right, as this clandestine group. But there's also the scientific term that defines the cells as a singular unit. And when you bring them together, it forms like a body or an architecture um, or a structure. So for us, um, we were thinking about like, what, do you, what are your thoughts on these metaphors about the body, the military cells? Like there's something there that's quite um, beautiful, but also like subversive, right? There's like an inverse relationship happening at the same time. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's a military term, term. Mm. and Palestinians also were um, sometimes calling themselves, they were not calling themselves cells because it's like, yeah, um, yeah, in, they were calling themselves like uh, companions more, depending whether they were left or right. Yeah. And so the term changes. But, uh, and the terms that they were choosing were reflecting a lot about having a, a collective of people working towards liberation. Um, so it reflects a lot also this cell, body cell coming together. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot about uh, collectivity and much less about individualism or being individual, singular mm -hmm. individuals, uh, which, yeah, which is now basically about that. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's interesting because I haven't thought about it also in that way when I chose the title. Of course, yeah, it comes from that. Um, but yeah, thank you for <laughs> pointing that out no for me to analyze in the future. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I have, I have a question from the audience. Um, so there, uh, someone asked a question about uh, the process of researching the gestures themselves. And I know that um, that was a kind of a similar question what, to what Claudia asked, but I think um, maybe it's going into your own kind of personal process or how you see, you know, researching gestures and how you see that um, progressing within your practice. Yeah, so, um, I mean, in each um, narrative, let's say, I've been approaching gestures a bit differently just to research, um, yeah, just to deepen my research into just the gestural world. <laughs> um, so in Cells of Illegal Education, the research was a lot about the tension between um, pedestrian gesture, daily gesture, and dancey dance. So we were like looking at the, where's the limit, what is readable, what is not, and why. And then it was a lot about working with um, parameters of what an archive is um, of the RIDA, which are not like um, treated as 
uh, <laughs> as the main or the only uh, parameters, but it's something to play with. Uh, so we were playing with repetition, um, a technique of repetition, and then a certain exteriority in the sense of how would people read the gesture? Are they readable? And then, um, yeah, place of consignation, which is the, the body. Um, so we were, yeah, just playing around with these three parameters, the tension between um, gesture and dancey dance. And then it was a collective work, of course. So I was, I, I chose the pictures um, and did the interviews and then also asked every, like the dancers, the collaborators to bring their own stories. Uh, they were not active in the first intifada because we were a younger generation. So it, it was all about our parents and grandparents. So everyone brought their own narratives from the family. Mm. Um, but it was a lot also about these pictures um, and imagining what was the before, the moment of the picture and the after. Um, yeah, so taking also the gestures from the pictures themselves. That's you. I don't know. Who. Wait, so that was my dog. They, they see. They can see people at the window, and they're very excited. Um, oh, the dog. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. Uh, are there any other questions that anyone has? Oh, oh, Georgia. Georgia has a. Yeah, Georgia. If you want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome. How do we, can we do that? Oh. I'm yeah, I think I did. <laughs> um, thank you. First of all, it's an incredible um, video, so thank you. And I, I think um, this is being touched on in many different ways, so if it's more of a comment than a, than a question, that's fine. But it's been so um, interesting hearing you talk about how you, you know, how you can disseminate um, bodily um, knowledge and then hearing you talk about how it was, you know, the piece was in some ways originally envisioned as an installation and then moved into the realm of video. And I'm really interested in how you've um, used sort of the, the medium and the genre of film or video and all of the sort of multimodal um, possibilities that you've really embraced, how it, you know, it integrates this um, very very strong narrative thread, the painting that you use at the beginning, the use of text. And I just um, wanted to hear a little bit about how you um, considered narrative and sort of the gathering of archives and knowledge and all this information in this, um, this sort of, I guess, video iteration of the project. Yeah, I mean, it was important for me to, to uh, reflect also the process uh, in the video itself or in the work itself because it was really like a, um, a research on, on the ground with the people talking to Birzeit University, the, the students, but also the institution, um, a student who is now in, like he, he's now a uh, architecture professor at the University of Gaza that I had to interview in the, over the phone because it's impossible to, yeah, to access Gaza. But it, so I, for me, it was very important to um, reflect the process, but also the words and the narrative of the people that they recounted. That's why sometimes it like the um, captions were there. Mm -hmm. they, they're not quotes and quotes, like I paraphrased them, but it, it is the context that people gave. And same with the pictures or the painting. It's it, there are things that people refer to uh, because paintings and posters were very present, like in the first intifada. Um, art, like the artistic movement, um, was contributing to this uh, popular resistance um, in all its forms. Um, so it was painting, writing, um, even dancing, but it was mainly dabke, the um, the Palestinian work dance um, so yeah I just wanted to reflect the context and the process of, um, of like the reason how it all uh, came together in in the work itself um, that's why I think it's important that it's there mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you say that um, some of those texts were paraphrased because even just the use of the word we and the fluidity of it and you know I'm trying to piece together um, where these different, you know, pieces are coming from was, was really powerful. So thank you. Thank you. 
Um, okay, unless there is anyone else. Uh, no. Okay, well, I wanted to thank Farah so much. Thank you so much for joining us today and letting us screen your, your work. It was, um, it was incredible to hear you talk a little bit about it. I think, you know, giving that context, that background about the process and the research and the work itself was a really, really um, fantastic thing. And uh, thanks again to everyone for spending the first Saturday of their long weekend uh, um, Zooming with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, I know Nora and um, Claudia worked really hard on this program. So congrats to you guys. And um, thank you for everyone coming, uh, unless Noor and uh, Claudia have anything. No, oh, just, just our gratitude to everybody um, yeah. you know, for joining us, as Matt said, on this you know early Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> and uh, to our lovely sorry about that. It's the no. time difference. <laughs> the time difference. Yeah, oh, good. we knew it was gonna happen. Uh, we were gonna have people that were sleeping in because they had a good Friday night. It's mm -hmm. not a big deal, but we're so thrilled to be having you. And um, we're also incredibly grateful to our sponsors, um, mm -hmm. the Brazil Art Foundation in Sharjah. Um, the Drum Art Gallery, Video Pool, Media Arts Center, um, and of course the Visual Arts Center of Clarington for yeah, hosting this. So hosting this program. So yeah. I'm grateful. So thank you. A million thanks. Yeah, and I wanted to thank you, of course, for having me and and, and, and um, for um, yeah, including me in this program and, and screening the work. And and I think there are two messages from Ivana and Lumir. Me, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> thanks. And uh, yeah, and this is a pretty, very happy we can do this. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And the, the talks are going to be available on the VAC website um, soon, whenever I actually get to put them up. Thank you so much, Ivana. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Yeah, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.